Well, hello. Welcome to Bruno Sand Dune State Park in South Central Idaho. We're looking here at the small little lake and one of the one of the small dunes here on the other side of the lake. But then the main feature here is this large dune that's mostly in the shade right now. And that's what we're we're heading up here. We're going to head to the top of that. Um, this is actually the largest single structured sand dune in North America. And in this video, I'll explain a little bit about what that means, explain some of the processes that govern uh, the distribution and the deposition of sand here, why this sand is so special in terms of its composition. And then we'll also look at why this dune is even here. Uh, so thanks for joining me. I'm geology professor Sean Wilsey. Uh, out here on this just beautiful day. This sand dune here at Bruno Dunes is really remarkable. Um, it kind of pops up in the middle of nowhere as you're driving by. Doesn't seem like it blends in much with the, the local landscape. And it's, again, as I said, the largest, tallest, single structured sand dune in North America. It's about 470 feet tall. It's about 130 meters or so. Um, really quite exceptional. And so let's start with a little diagram here that explains why this dune is here. Let me start with um, just kind of the regional landscape here. You can see we've got a bit of a basin here. We've got some bluffs here to the west. The bluffs to the north um, are where the Snake River is. The Snake River sits at the base of those dark uh, bluffs to the north here. Uh, and then as we come over this way, some of it's obscured by the dune here, but there's actually uh, some, some bluffs or some hills to our east. So this dune field sits in a, in a depression, in a low area, kind of a horseshoe shape area with the Snake River to the north. So let's look at this little diagram here I put together that helps explain that. This is actually an area called Eagle Cove. And we can start here with this diagram I've drawn of the Snake River from west to east. And anciently the Snake River had a large bend or a large meander in its path. And if you know anything about rivers, you know that on the outside bend of a river, that's where the erosion is going to tend to be um, focused. So as the river flows along, the current actually slams in to the outside bend of its path and has more velocity there. And therefore, it's eroding the banks of the stream much more effectively there. So that's where we see the erosion concentrated. As the stream swings around the bend, over to this point, the same thing happens. So we get a lot of focused erosional energy on the outside bend of this meandering stream. And so what happens over time is this narrow neck of land between the two paths of the river eventually gets eroded down thinner and thinner and thinner until eventually it gets breached and the river uh, flows through this gap here, abandons this former channel, this meander here, and that's exactly what we have now. We have the river flowing to the north, uh, heading to the west, but this abandoned path of the Snake River is this low depression here we call Eagle Cove. This plays a pretty big role in determining why we have the sand dunes here. This has created uh, a low area with highlands on either side, and this is the place where we find the sand dunes and the deposition of the sand. Let's switch over to Another diagram I put together here that will explain a little bit about how and why uh, we get this sand deposited here. So uh, let's see if we can hopefully see this okay. So in this case, this is a typical sand dune. So we've got the wind, in this case, moving from left to right on your, on your view there. So we've got the windward side and what we call the leeward side, the back side of the dune. So when the wind is blowing, the little sand grains are kind of bumping and skipping and hopping and rolling up towards the crest of the dune. When the, du when the sand gets to the crest of the dune, it barely goes over the top of the dune, gets deposited on the leeward side, and it starts to accumulate. Now it's protected by the wind and the sand just piles up. But eventually the sand gets over steepened on this new slope and it avalanches down the backside. And then this continues, right? So it keeps coming up towards the top avalanching down the backside. So this is what we see in a typical sand dune. Here at Bruno Dunes, we have a really tall dune, much taller than we typically see in many dune fields. And there's gotta be a reason why this dune would, would pile up so high. And the reason is the wind direction. If the wind direction is just it predominantly coming from one compass direction, 
then the dune field will probably not be as tall. But here at Bruno, we have what we call a reversing dune. So what we get in the next stage here is the wind has changed direction. And so the sand that was previously deposited on this side now starts moving up the other side of the dune. We switch from the windward side and the leeward side, they switch places. We start pushing sand back up towards the top. And I think you can see that over time, this is one way that the sand can aggregate, deposit on top of itself and ultimately build uh, a taller and taller dune complex. So here again, the sand, the wind switched direction again. Now it's moving to the right. The sand is moving up, up the dune. And these reversals are what allows this dune to uh, achieve such massive heights. We're looking into the sun here, so it's a little tricky, but I've got a big, uh, a big steep hike ahead to get up to the crest of this thing. And it looks like the wind's out of the east right now. So you can kind of see some of the sand kicking off the top. Well, we might have to abort the original plan and maybe do something else if it's really bad up there. Um, so one of the reasons that we get reversals, you might ask yourself, well, why would the wind be switching back and forth? And if you know a little bit about Idaho's weather in particular, or just weather that you get at this latitude of about 40, 42 degrees latitude, we get um, storm systems that come in from the Pacific Northwest, usually cold fronts in the winter and spring, sometimes in the late fall. And as those fronts approach, we get wind from the east. So air wants to move towards the lowest pressure that's available. So a front is a place where the air is being lifted. It creates less pressure. And so ahead of the front, the wind comes from the east. So we get east winds coming from eastern Idaho and Wyoming across southern Idaho, moving towards the west. And then as the front moves past, the wind shifts direction and comes out of the west. And it can be strong either way, although I'd say dominantly our strongest winds come out of the west. But even today with, you know, 10, 15 mile an hour breezes, it's enough to be moving the sand up at the crest of the dune. So I'm going to take you on my little journey here. We're going to go up to the top of the dune, uh, hopefully be able to videotape up there and see what the sand conditions are like. Get a nice view from up there. Look at the composition of the sand and then we'll move off the top of the dune over here to the far side of the lake. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll go look at some other features that we see here. There's some interesting deposits related to the Bonneville flood that help us figure out why we have the sand here um, and what this area was like about 17,000 years ago during the Bonneville flood. So hang in there, we'll go up to the top of the dune and uh, thanks for joining me. Well, I'm almost near the top, um, but this is a great little teaching opportunity here. Um, you can see the crest of the dune just ahead in the sunlight. And to kind of illustrate the point I made about on the leeward side of the dune, which is what I'm on now, the sand actually producing avalanches. You can see this lobe of sand that's come down off the top, producing the avalanche. This is all natural. I'm the only one up here, believe me. Uh, there's my footprints coming up. Uh, only one up here right now. And you can see, looking this way, again, these dark little ridges here are these little lobes of avalanche sand that's come down the dunes. So really dynamic environment. You can also see the steepness of the slope here on the backside of the dune. Um, we'll see how it's going to get tricky here. It's real steep to the top um, and hopefully the sand's not blowing around too much. Uh, but we'll go up on top and take a look on the other side and see how windy it is and what kind of processes we can see there. Just beautiful ripples up here uh, in the sand. Fantastic. I think the wind might have shifted a little bit. Uh, it was out of the, the east. Now it feels like it's a little more out of the south, but I imagine in this kind of bowl that the dune sits in, you might get some kind of swirling uh, types of wind patterns and maybe something that's not kind of the pervasive wind direction. So we'll head up on top and uh, we'll catch you guys up there. Okay, I'm up at the crest of the dune now. And it's definitely breezy up here, but a great vantage point to just really see this dune in action and the role that the wind plays in moving the sand grains. I hope you can see all the sand grains being rolled and skipped and bounced uh, up the surface of the sand dune and then kicked off the leeward side here down the back side. Here's our view uh, towards the actual summit, which isn't too far away. And then also the view of this Eagle Cove area 
looking to the south and to the east there. So you can see this big, uh, big embayment, this big basin that the dune sits in. I mentioned that this is a, the largest single structure dune. Let me explain what that is. So other dunes are taller than the Bruno sand dune, but they're taller because they're braced against something. They're braced against uh, maybe a, a mountain or other dune fields. Whereas this big pile of sand that's almost 500 feet tall um, has no structural support anywhere. It's just piled on top of itself. And that's why, that's what makes it the largest or tallest single structure dune in uh, North America. We can walk up a little, a little further here. You can see how narrow and razor edge this ridge crest is. Pretty windy here. Hopefully you can see the sand whipping over. And luckily, when you're on the windward side like I am, even though it's windy and the sand's moving, it's all down near the ground. Uh, I'm standing up and there's no sand hitting my face, getting in my mouth, getting in my ear, anything like that. But as I was coming up the leeward side here, there was a good 30 seconds or so of just kind of hunkering down and, and getting through it. So, um, I also mentioned the unique nature of the Bruno sand. Um, when you look at the sand closely, it's a little darker than the sand you would typically see at the beach or maybe another dune. Um, most beach sand or dune sand, it can be a lot of colors, but most sand is dominated by quartz, which will be a lighter color. But here at Bruno, we really have a darker color. And as you look at the grains closely, it's almost like a salt and pepper mixture. Um, and those black grains are little tiny broken up weathered pieces of basalt. The lava rock, the volcanic rock that dominates here in southern Idaho. So you can imagine the Snake River, the Bonneville Flood, and other processes breaking up that basalt, transporting it down the river systems, uh, or ultimately with the wind and then depositing here, here at Bruno. And then the other component, the, the lighter color, the salty portion of the dune sand, um, is quartz. And so if we kind of turn back towards uh, the west, the big mountains in the distance are the Oahe Mountains, and they have a lot of granite and rhyolite, two rocks that are really rich in quartz. So we have a lot of quartz-rich rocks in the area that provide a source for the quartz, and then we have the basalts as well that provide a source for the basalts. So, um, We'll walk a little bit further here. The plan from here is we'll hike down off this ridge, um, probably go around this next dune, and that'll put us at the east side of the lake. And what I want to show you next is something completely different from sand, completely different from wind uh, dominated processes, and show you some evidence of what the Bonneville flood did in this big basin when it flooded this area about 17,000 years ago. Uh, and that'll put us pretty close to the little neck of land between the two lakes. And then we'll walk back down to the parking lot down here. So, so join me at the next stop and we'll look at some uh, interesting Bonneville flood sediments. Okay, I'm back. We, uh, we were up there at the crest of the far dune. That's the highest one. Um, and then we dropped down off the east side of the dune, kind of circumnavigated uh, this main big dune here. And we're on the east side of the lake here. You might be able to pick out, there's actually two people up at the tippy top of this closest dune here, but kind of give you some scale and sense of uh, perspective here. So we've come all the way around the dune field uh, to the east side of Eagle Cove, lots of sand here, uh, wind dominated environment. Uh, and then as we're heading more or less back to the cars, uh, we run into a very different sort of outcrop here. We encounter kind of a beige unit, um, lighter colored than the sand itself. It looks like it's well layered. Um, so let's head down here, make a few observations about this material, and then see if we can piece this together. Remember that this area, Eagle Cove, this low area, 
was uh, inundated by the Bonneville flood. So during the Bonneville flood, this embayment, this abandoned meander along the Snake River's path was completely submerged in water in a nice wide area. And I think that'll play into our, our story here a little bit. So let's get in here and take a look at this stuff. We can see it's, again, incredibly well layered. Um, it's uh, what we would call laminated. The layers are incredibly close together. They're, you know, a millimeter or two, maybe a couple, maybe a centimeter or two at the most, um, but very finely laminated. If we pick up some of this material here, and kind of touch it. Uh, it's definitely finer than sand. Uh, it's pretty soft and crumbly. You can kind of crush it, but it feels more or less silt size. Um, maybe a little bit of fine sand, but more or less silt. It's a finer grain, smaller size particle than what we see uh, in the sand itself. And so as we try to figure out this story here, um, the other thing we might notice here are there pretty pretty obvious in a couple spots I think there's sort of these ripples in here you can see these sort of undulating surfaces the the beds aren't perfectly planar in every spot in some places they kind of go uh, up and down a little bit and these are called uh, ripples and so ripples can form in a couple different ways if we have asymmetric ripples with a steep side and then a more gentle side, um, that indicates that we have current moving in one direction. Could be water, could be wind, but the shape of the ripples tell us something about what the current, whether it's water or wind, how it's moving the sediment around. And on, in contrast, if we have more symmetrically shaped ripples, uh, like we have here, that indicates that whatever is moving the material is sort of moving it back and forth. It's oscillating, it's sloshing around a little bit, but it doesn't have a dominant direction of transport. Uh, and I think you might agree with me as you look at these ripples here, uh, they tend to be pretty symmetrical overall. They kind of go up and down. They're not perfectly formed, but the ones that we see here, um, I think are fairly well uh, symmetrical in terms of their shape. And so what this, what this is, is if you imagine the Bonneville flood coming through here and it's carrying the big boulders down the channel, but those would get dropped out pretty quickly as it slows down in this big embayment in Eagle Cove. So as the water slows down here, it allows even the finest material to be deposited. And each little layer in here, each little lamination that we're seeing in this silty deposit is some of that fine material that was held in suspension in the river water in the Bonneville flood, sort of settling out. But apparently there was just enough movement in the water to um, you know, make some small ripples in places, create some uh, variation to these uh, these these laminated beds and you can kind of see some of these have within the beds even a little bit of the laminations in there as well so a nice little outcrop a little reminder amongst all the dunes here of the story we have with the Bonneville flood that it still leaves its mark on this landscape so I hope you've enjoyed uh, visiting the Bruno sand dunes learning why they're so tall learning a little bit about the composition of the sand how it came to be I uh, appreciate everyone for joining me and appreciate any support you can give please, please be sure to like share subscribe do all those good things uh, there's a couple ways to donate there's a donate button on the banner of the YouTube page there's links under the video description and there's also a, a thanks button uh, just below the screen on the bottom right as well but whatever support you can give i appreciate and we'll see you next time from another scenic and awesome geologic location